Hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. My name is Michael Barr. I'm the Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's my honor to be uh, coasting this, uh, this conversation with uh, our wonderful colleagues at the University of Michigan Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and in conjunction with the University of Michigan's Washington, D.C. Alumni Club. So it's a great event. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I've got three wonderful guests with me. I have uh, Ambassador Susan Page, who is a professor of practice at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I have Professor Barry Rabe, who is the Ira Harris Professor of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. And I have Professor Betsy Stevenson. I'm really delighted um, to have all three of these wonderful Ford School colleagues with me uh, today. We're gonna be talking about the early news from the Biden-Harris administration. What have we learned? What kind of trends do we see? There are so many different topic areas that one could cover, uh, but we're gonna try and focus mostly today on three really big areas. One is economic policy, the second is global affairs and foreign policy. And the third is environmental policy. And we'll be happy to weave in other issues as they come up, uh, but those will be our three big areas of focus um, uh, so far. Betsy is coming to us uh, from Australia today, and uh, Barry and uh, Susan are joining us from Ann Arbor. And I believe we probably have an audience from around the world um, for this uh, conversation. So Betsy, I'm gonna start out uh, with you since you've been up since 3.25 in the morning, your time. I figured I'd pick on you first. Let's talk a little bit about economic policy. So the administration uh, put forward a plan, uh, a $1.9 trillion stimulus plan that passed in record time uh, Congress uh, uh, came to the table uh, and uh, passed this plan. Now, people are saying uh, a lot of things about this. I want to get into a couple of them. One thing people are wondering about is, with all this new spending, is there a risk of inflation, and, and how worried should we be about inflation in the economy today? Uh, so that is, uh, I think, the really uh, big question. And what I want to do is, is break it down a little bit so people can understand where that risk of inflation could come from. Uh, so 1.9 trillion is roughly eight and a half percent of GDP. And if you think about um, where are, if we put together everything we're producing today and compare it to how much we were producing prior to the pandemic, when people thought, we were sort of at our potential. Maybe we could be doing a little bit more, but not a lot more. You know, we're, you know, where we should be today is maybe about five percent bigger. Um, so, you know, we're to put that really put the numbers on it. We're two and a half percent smaller than we were prior to the start of the pandemic. But you know, maybe you could think about us being five, instead of two and a half percent bigger, maybe five percent bigger by the end of twenty twenty one. But we, uh, we just saw the government try to expand by eight and a half percent. Is this going to cause a lot of dollars chasing, a, to, chasing you know, not enough goods and therefore putting upward pressure on prices? I'm going to throw one more weird thing into the mix uh, that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. But this actually wasn't a bad year financially for the top end of the income distribution. And the result is a, like a, a large amount of what you might call excess savings, savings beyond what we would have expected people to have accumulated if we hadn't had the pandemic. And that's actually another $2 trillion. So roughly $2 trillion in excess savings, now $2 trillion in government spending. What if we all go out and have a big party with that $4 trillion tomorrow? Well, we'd be in trouble. 
right? We wouldn't be, there wouldn't be enough stuff being produced and that would push prices up. So that's the fear of inflation, but I'm not that worried about it for a couple of reasons. One is that I just don't think we're all going to go out and try to spend that money tomorrow. So even if we think about that 1.9 trillion, um, what we've seen is that when we send people money like we did with those economic impact payments, people tend to save or pay down debt as much as they actually tend to go out and spend it. So maybe only a third of that, the money that goes directly to people gets spent. So that means that we can afford to be bigger because people are going to just put some of that in the bank. Um, and I think a lot of that excess savings that has accumulated, I don't think people are ready to rip off the Band-Aid, empty their savings accounts and go out there and explosively spend. So that's where the anxiety comes from. Now, the Fed is very confident right now that it can, uh, uh, that it could manage inflation if they were to see signs of it. But one thing I want to say before I, I turn it back to you for another question or to have this conversation is that we are probably going to see inflation rise in the short run. And so I don't want you to see that and be like, oh, Betsy was wrong or the Fed is messing up. Because what we have is some supply problems right now, plus we have this increase in demand, and it's possible that, that the demand moves faster than supply. And if demand moves faster than supply, that's going to push prices up. But I am confident that supply is going to be responding to those, uh, those uh, higher prices very quickly. And as supply increases, that's going to push the prices back down. So we have some of these supply chain bottlenecks. I don't know if you heard, but grape nuts has been, you couldn't buy it for the last few months, right? So Yeah, it's been really hard to get. That's a popular cereal in our household. <laughs> but now grape nuts says it's shipping. Everything's fine. There's going to be plenty of grape nuts. So that's what I mean when I say the supply will come back. And so for those of you who've been buying, you know, at grape nuts on eBay at marked up prices, you're going to be able to get your grape nuts back at the lower prices very soon. So we, when supply expands, that takes away some of that inflationary pressure. Mm -hmm. So the Fed has been very clear that it's okay to run inflation a little above 2% for a while. Mm -hmm. They see that as transient inflation, as long as our long run inflation uh, doesn't look like it's going to get ahead of us and, and be above 2%. So, um, you know, we got to have some trust in our monetary policy authority, the Federal Reserve, to manage these inflationary pressures, but also realize even though it's a lot of money, it's not all going to hit the economy on the same day. That's great, Betsy. Thanks. Really uh, helpful explanation. I'm going to come back to you to, to ask some more questions about the uh, current state of the economy, but I want to uh, turn now to uh, bring in Barry Rabe. Uh, Barry, uh, there's been lots going on in the administration from the first days, a, a slew of executive at orders, a rejoining of the Paris Climate Accord, a, a, an immense burst of activity at the start. You know, where is this heading? Does this, does this signal that we're actually going to get something done on climate change? How should we interpret these early steps by the Biden administration to... Uh, rejoin the conversation on, on climate policy. Thanks, Michael. And, and you're right. These first weeks have been just stunning in terms of the sheer volume of activity in an administration that's trying to do so many things at the same time to then try to reposition the U.S. on environmental policy, particularly climate issues. I had no idea Joe Biden had so many executive orders that could link to some aspect of climate change. And it reflects a kind of resetting of the table and agenda and even repositioning almost every unit of the federal government to begin to think about their energy use and climate consequences and impacts across the board, including, as you mentioned, the reintroduction of the U.S. into the Paris Climate Agreement. That said, this is a big step, but it is only the first step. And in political terms and even administrative terms, it is the easiest of the steps that the administration will want to take. We will be looking at major new statutory engagement, and this is going to follow. It's been 31 years since any Congress and any president has come to an agreement through new legislation on clean air. 
It has been 34 years since any Congress or president has agreed on water policy legislation. And we've never passed a comprehensive climate bill in all of these decades of concern. All of that is to come and the strategies, as well as the fact that this is a two level game. There's the domestic politics, but then there's the international game and rejoining Paris is a step, but it's partially symbolic. And for the US to have any chance of being credible going forward in the next years and decades on climate, they have to back that reintroduction to Paris with some very real tangible achievements namely investments and reductions. All of that is to come in the coming Congress and in the coming weeks and months. Bira, you've written a lot about the fragility of these steps that governments take to move forward on climate change or on carbon pricing. They, they can get destabilized very quickly when a new administration comes in or when there's a change in politics. How do you think the Biden administration is going to navigate this? In, do you think they have a chance of instituting lasting change on this issue it's it's obviously it's a it's a 30 to 50 year problem not a two year problem or a four year problem is there an opportunity for lasting change in this space that you see based on what you've seen thus, thus far well that's right we've actually lost a lot of time in launching initiatives that then get dialed back that's certainly true of many states but it's been the story of the federal government along with the fact that we've never passed any kind of credible climate legislation or retrofitted clean air legislation to really be applicable through, through legislation, it's put all of the activity that is not handled at the subfederal level on presidents. And we've seen in presidency after presidency kind of executive-based strategies, and the grand champion of that was the, the two-term Obama administration looking aggressively at every corner and tool of the Clean Air Act for the transportation sector, vehicle emissions, oil and gas, methane, landfill, every possible way you could kind of reconfigure that statute and apply it to carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. And after that administration and four years of the succeeding Trump administration, a whole series of actions, there's essentially nothing left. There's nothing to show for it. Almost all of those administrative st steps have not proven durable. And one of the main challenges, or one of the many challenges for, for Team Biden is sort of what to do with that package and how, try, how far to push on purely administrative action. One of the things that's clearly in play in all of these areas, and my colleagues have been arguing this for some time now, that as you move into a system dominated by the presidency, when Congresses largely do not function, which has been true of environment and climate for some time, regardless of partisan control, that also shifts the balance of opposition power to the party in the states that's led by the party opposite opposite the president. And so already we've begun to see Republican attorneys general file suit and challenge some of the very early steps of the Biden administration, just as we saw the reverse. Republican attorneys general challenge almost everything President Obama did and ultimately create a, a kind of administrative gridlock. And that's, I think, the, the durability issue that, that you're, you're identifying and one for which the, the legislative path, however that is struck through Congress, in my thinking, is going to be absolutely essential if we are going to begin a more systematic and sustained approach to this issue after all of these years and decades where we've just been fumbling while well, a great many other countries have made some significant advances. Barry, we're going to come back to that question on the legislative front in just a moment. I want to bring um, Ambassador Page, Susan Page, into the conversation and uh, Susan, it's it's been um, also a very active uh, time on the foreign policy front. Again, uh, just uh, in the first uh, couple months of the administration, one of the um, areas that uh, the administration seems to be trying to begin to set a, a new tone on is on democracy and human rights. And I'm wondering how you view the early steps. What are the signs of a, the same policy or different policies? What direction do you see the Biden-Harris administration going in on key issues in human rights and democracy? Well, I think, um, first of all, thank you very much. And thanks also to the U of M Club. Um, this is great. Uh, I just want to say that they are making a lot of positive moves um, uh, with these executive actions, rejoining the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. On the um, human rights side, they have rejoined, well, they have made the steps to become, again, a member of the Human Rights Council, which is excellent. 
Um, so they're, they're, they're saying the right things and the approach which, which is focusing very much on a return to normal and uh, a focus on diplomacy, multilateralism, working again with our allies. Um, I think all of that is really very positive. We do have to remember, however, that there are some steps that they have not taken, and uh, it's unclear exactly why. For instance, the Trump administration had placed the um, chief prosecutor and one of her deputies under sanctions, the most uh, egregious kinds of sanctions that are have in the past only been reserved for human rights abusers not people trying to prosecute the abusers of the most horrific kinds, kinds of, um, of international crimes against humanity. So um, the ICC prosecutor and one of her deputies, um, both Africans, remain under sanctions. This is something that's actually pretty easy to do. He, he could actually just lift the sanctions. It's an executive order. Um, and these are really far-reaching um, sanctions. Um, it, it remains to be seen exactly what they will do on this front, but um, one thing that could be a possibility is as they review their stance on some of these uh, international agreements, which is what they have said that they are doing, um, the chief prosecutor will be leaving the court in June. Uh, her term will be finished. And the incoming prosecutor is um, not under sanctions. And um, that could provide the opportunity, new start and new prosecutor, perhaps that will be the time. And in June, they have to uh, reevaluate the sanctions anyway, as uh, per normal uh, business. And so that might provide the opportunity, but it would have been nice to see them uh, along with repealing the Muslim ban uh, and other executive orders doing away with this one and demonstrating our um, complete, um, even though we're not a member, a state party to the Rome statute that founded the, the International Criminal Court, uh, it would still really signify that we are serious about human rights and human rights abuses. So a question mark, at least for now, about how that's, um, how that's going. And, and we're gonna, I want to return to this question of human rights when we talk about China in just a little bit. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin us back to the domestic economy for a moment. Uh, Betsy, another big thing people are worried about with a $1.9 trillion bill and, and, uh, and maybe future spending is how much is too much in terms of debt? We've been talking about inflation. But the ratio of debt to GDP, which is a commonly used metric, is um, uh, rising rapidly. Uh, other people say, no, that's the wrong metric. You should look at debt service to GDP, uh, which is uh, much, much lower, of course. Um, how, do you, how do you think about where we are with the debt overall, where we should be going? What's the right analytic frame to have on the question? So. Um, I think you've got to start your analytic frame by asking whether government spending is crowding out private sector spending. And if government spending is getting in the way of business spending because uh, there's not enough workers left, there's not enough factories, there's not enough land, there's not enough uh, uh, savings for them to borrow, if interest rates are going really high, then our government spending is starting to crowd out things in the real economy. None of those things are happening right now. So if you go back to, let's go back to the 1990s when the Clinton administration. Betsy, I think you may be frozen. Can other folks hear her? Um, uh, okay, sorry, I think it just, I had a little glitch. So I was thing I was saying when this hand, if you go back to the 1990s, when the Clinton administration wanted to get a handle on the debt, what was going on? Well, we actually had pretty high interest rates and you did see businesses that weren't borrowing uh, to make investments that might have made them 
if uh, they could borrow cheaper. And, but that's not the situation we're in right now. We've spent really now almost two decades with very low inflation and very low interest rates, interest rates near zero and trying to induce uh, businesses to borrow. It makes it very cheap for governments to borrow. So Larry Summers has talked a lot about this concept of secular stagnation. And, and that really is about the idea that businesses are just not investing as much as we would want them to, to get the kind of economic growth and full resource utilization uh, that would make our economy thrive. When they're not doing that, it's a good time for government to step in, borrow money, and do public infrastructure projects. I think that's the next step you're going to see out of the Biden administration. I don't think we worry about the debt if what they're doing is borrowing to invest in building a stronger economy, because that debt becomes easier to service. So you mentioned the debt service ratio. It's going to be a function of interest rates. It's also going to be a function of the size of GDP. So if we borrow we grow the economy and interest rates are low, it's really easy to manage that debt. If we don't grow, interest rates are high, it becomes harder to manage the debt. Right now, I think our eyes need to be on the prize of getting GDP uh, growth going again and using uh, the full potential of the American economy. So uh, basically to sum up, we've got low interest rates and we got the potential for more GDP growth, let's invest now. Exactly. And that's why I said you just start by thinking about is government crowding out other stuff? And right now it's not. So, Betsy, that brings me to, I think, another interesting area that that links what you were just talking about with also environmental policy, which is what what the next bill might be. There's been some discussion of a major infrastructure investment, a major push on green jobs, uh, work on climate change. And the number of people are throwing around is a bill that might be a three trillion dollar price tag uh, over the next ten years. So not one point nine trillion in one year, but three trillion over ten years. Still a very large investment in the economy. Um, Barry, uh, how do you see this bill helping, not helping um, the broader goal of worrying about climate change? And is there any possibility? of finding some common ground in such a bill on climate change issues. You're right. And the phrase that you used a little, just a moment ago, you know, clearly applies to the energy sector and actually would use the energy and climate arena as a vessel for much of that $3 trillion or whatever ultimately the bill would look like. The idea here represents a pivot from some traditional thinking on climate change, which is one of the core strategies is actually putting price on carbon emissions through a tax or a cap and trade scheme, working away from that direction and a massive investment strategy, along with a, a cap on overall emissions or, or, or fossil fuel energy use, which we can discuss separately. Uh, the idea here is to look across all dimensions of the economy, the transportation sector, the housing sector, thinking about energy efficiency, you name it. What is every way conceivable that you could bring down some level of emission, agricultural sector and the like, and invest through a combination of tax preferences, credits, subsidies, and the like. Just run through all the ways we use energy and think about ways there could be some adjustment, changes in how we purchase our vehicles and what might get more people to purchase electric vehicles, put charging stations in their home, and on and on it goes. So it's really a, a kind of a, a cap on emissions, but a massive investment strategy and project some aspects of what the Europeans are doing with what they're calling the Green Deal, although the mix in Europe is looking as if it's going to be very, very different. You asked about the bipartisan issues. And of course, when you create a massive spending project and talk about every conceivable way one could reduce carbon, that may get the ears of, lot of lots of legislators if you're from a fossil fuel producing district or state. And you like the idea of carbon sequestration or storage, which is a very expensive largely untested strategy to use fossil fuels in the production of energy, but store that underground. If government would cover those costs, carbon sequestration and storage might pick you up a few votes in the House and certainly a number of votes in the Senate. And on it goes. Uh, another piece that may come into play here, and we don't know the particulars yet, is what happens if we are going to be looking at a major, major pivot away from fossil fuels. The, current, the latest we're hearing is that the administration is going to try to reduce American greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 levels, which is a fairly high year, by 50% by 
by the end of the current decade. That's a staggering pivot and shift. It would mean far-reaching decline of certainly what's left of coal, but much more significantly oil and natural gas with just massive dislocations, particularly in high production and high use states, places like Texas, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. So another piece of this is what's being called the just transition package. How do you make all of these kinds of adjustments and transitions to allow people who might have been trained in petroleum engineering or drive a truck that moves energy supplies across the panhandle of Texas into other kinds of fields and works? That's not an easy economic kind of transition. And so this whole notion of just transition is really just beginning to warm up. What would that look like? What would that cost? And how much of any kind of energy or climate related stimulus be focused on that aspect of the transition that's to come? And so the list here is potentially long. I would expect any initial proposal to get longer and longer as every proponent of almost every technology and alternative imaginable comes to the table and thinking about how that might play in their Senate race or in a legislative district and then seeing at the end what the, the total looks like and, and really even how far $2 trillion could go to satisfy every constituency that might want some role to play in this process. Barry, let's talk a little bit more about this concept of just transition. I'll bring Betsy into this conversation too. So it, it had been long been kind of dogma of uh, international economists that free trade on net is good for the United States, but that there'll be required adjustments internally. Workers need to be supported in transition industries. And oftentimes what's happened in the last, well, I think many, many, many decades is that we get the dislocation, but there's not the support behind it. And then you undermine support for trade. In the environmental area, are we going to face a similar kind of thing where people say there's going to be dislocation? Yeah, we promise to take care of you, but but then we don't. And then it creates a, a political backlash that makes environmental change more difficult. I'd, I'd be interested, both Barry and Betsy, on your perspectives on that. Sure. I, I do think that this is an enormous coming challenge. If you go back to the Trump campaign in 2016, wrapping himself around those iconic coal miners, making all kinds of promises about bringing coal back, didn't happen. The pace of coal plant retirements doubled from the Trump administration to the second Obama term. And even there, after lots of interest and effort in dealing with a much, much smaller population base, number of workers in coal, those are issues and challenges. But when we talk about all aspects of oil and natural gas and the uses of those in transportation as well as in the electricity sector, we are talking about much longer supply chains, far more individuals, and especially 15 years since the invention of fracking, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, which has spread out the sheer amount of oil and gas production. In Oklahoma, there are 72, 77 counties, 72 produce oil and gas. Uh, you can look at a great many states that 15 years ago thought they were getting out of oil and gas, Colorado, New Mexico. And because of fracking, being able to penetrate that shale and the fact that now the U.S. is producing such prodigious amounts of oil and gas that would have been unthinkable 15 or 20 years ago. These have been big growth sectors, particularly for certain regions and certain states, including states that are probably among those with legislators least likely to be supportive of major climate legislation. So this is going to be a significant test and challenge, especially if we are beginning to talk about a really radical, far-reaching transition. And with it, a pivot to most of our transportation energy source, not from liquid oil and oil, oil, but rather from electricity and all that that might mean for distribution, distribution of costs as well as jobs. So, um, you know, I, I think the thing is, I agree with it, everything that, that Barry said, and but I just want to put in there that um, there are other changes coming um, that are going to impact jobs. So, um, you know, we're seeing technological change. Uh, we're seeing, you know, artificial intelligence coming very, very rapidly. You know, we haven't really talked about this much in the last year because the pandemic has focused us away from things like, you know, will the robots take our jobs, but the robots are still coming. And in fact, we just had uh, about the fastest adoption pace of technology I've ever seen because of the pandemic. And we are going, 
the repercussions from that are, and the benefits as well as potential costs from that are still going to play out over the next uh, few years. But, you know, if you think about the number one job in every state that a man with only a high school degree has, it's driving a truck. That's the number one job in every state for men with, uh, only, with with a, only a high school degree. And we know that uh, self-driving is coming. It, it's not going to be overnight. So people often give that example. And then they're like, one day we have self-driving trucks and we need zero truck drivers. You know, I, I have a car that has some self-driving technology features. And what I find is I can do longer distances with less exhaustion. And what that's going to mean is some truck drivers are going to become more productive. They're going to do longer distances with less exhaustion but that's gonna mean you need fewer truck drivers. And so it will still be a somewhat gradual process, but it's still gonna decimate an industry that a lot of men have relied on. And that's one small example, but we've got to start thinking about how we transition people. You did see Trump campaign on this idea of I'm gonna restore the old. We're gonna assemble iPhones in the United States. This is a, a terrible economic strategy because either iPhones become out of reach in terms of cost for most Americans, or we're paying people extremely low wages to assemble iPhones in the United States. The idea that we're going to rebuild coal, we're going to rebuild our manufacturing base, we're a service sector based economy, and we have to figure out how we're going to transition people to good, respectable, well-paying service sector jobs with dignity. Um, and that's got to be true for the environmental reasons Barry mentioned. It's got to be true for technological change. It's got to be due for trade. We've got to stop thinking about compensating workers based on why they lost their job, right? We had all this trade adjustment assistance. What about technology adjustment assistance? What about green job adjustment assistance? Let's stop thinking about why people are losing their jobs and just focus on the fact that their jobs are going away and they need a just, a just transition. And if I might add, there really might be some intriguing opportunities here because in some of the very areas where oil and gas jobs are greatest, that's where we're actually seeing some of the biggest growth in wind and solar, where there's less political opposition to siting turbines and farms, other kinds of things. So that is not an easy automatic match. You don't, you're not a petroleum engineer one day and then a wind turbine expert the next. And yet there are some really interesting opportunities. And I think we're even beginning to see in some states, and Wyoming and its governor, one of the you know the reddest states in the country is really beginning to talk about every possible energy source and the wind production in, in Wyoming is just staggering as they're beginning to think about these transitions. If you can begin to stitch this together creatively, I think this is a great opportunity to think outside the box on all of these issues and areas. The challenge is not just dividing, politically dividing the country in terms of who the winners and losers are going to be because the politics in each state or district, and, and that's going to be a huge challenge for our process. To, particularly when it comes to allocating any money from this uh, from this from this big pot but it does suggest there might be a path forward if we can find ways to genuinely invest in these technologies and genuinely take care of the communities that um, that may suffer as there's this transition happening there is a, a potential path for a bipartisan approach maybe <laughs> Never easy, but it can happen. We've actually seen a few instances. I, I actually think one of the most remarkable things that I saw over the last five years in climate policy was in the last weeks of Donald Trump's presidency. And it was a legislation piece of legislation that passed with bipartisan support to phase out HFCs, a chemical substance that we all have access to and use in our refrigerators and air conditioning systems. It was a transition strategy. It was structured together through exactly as you're suggesting, Michael, a, a broad bipartisan compromise. And it actually sets up the possibility that the US might finally ratify a separate treaty, which would be the first time we've ratified an environmental treaty in almost 40 years. So that's not an easy proxy for carbon, just given sheer scale. But there are moments, even in our recent troubled past, where it, it has happened. And as you said, this just happened, and it happened for you know, a, a major part of potential contributors or past contributors to, to climate change. So there, there, is a, there is some hope. Let's talk about another, um, Absolutely. Uh, another topic here that um, is extremely difficult facing the Biden administration straight out of the gate is China. 
uh, where the relationship has been quite difficult for a number of years, for many years, um, during the Obama administration, during the Trump administration, and now during the Biden-Harris administration, the relationship with China has been difficult already, even in the first uh, couple months. It is such a critical relationship for the future of the global economy, for the United States, and for many countries around the world. The first um, uh, foray into this was the Alaska summit, uh, and there were a lot of sparks flying at that summit. It was not a not a moment of um, uh, of uh, the two countries coming together. And Susan, one area that seemed right off the bat to cause friction was on democracy and human rights. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and and how you see the role of democracy and human rights debate in in the context of the U.S.-China relationship. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's been interesting actually following the discussion, but one of the emphases that um, the Biden administration has placed is working with our allies. And that includes working with our allies on China. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that um, Secretary Blinken even highlighted was that um, in working with the EU um, and other allies, for the first time as a bloc, the EU uh, has imposed sanctions on China for human rights violations. This is for the first time since the 1980s that the bloc has done that on China. Um, and at the same time, um, it was the EU, Canada, the UK, and the US together imposing sanctions on China uh, for in response to their alleged abuses um, in Xinjiang. So, you know, I think that there is at least some commonality. The challenge is always that we're selective. I mean, all countries are selective in how we roll these things out. And so at times when our interests outweigh other interests, we are not always consistent across the board. And that's why we have diplomacy. That's why we have relations that um, you know, it's it's easy if you're looking at things on paper. It's not always easy when you actually have to deal with them in in practice and in reality. But I think that that is an area that they are trying to work with other allies. And I would say that the same is holding true even with respect to trade. Um, coming to an a, at least some sort of an understanding uh, that. Other countries have relations with China that are very nuanced, that are not just a blanket, one size fits all. And we have to respect that and, and understand that they are also making decisions that are based on what they see as in their own best interests. So um, I think it's still a work in progress and, and it will continue to be challenging, um, but it's also a little bit more of the way things used to be where the US became this global power because of World War II, but it hadn't been that way before. And so it's also a recalibration, a rebalancing, and trying to figure out where we fit in and where other countries have a choice. Thanks, Susan. I think that um, you know the relationship is is super nuanced and complicated in economics too. And Betsy, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of guidance about how to think about the issues facing the US-China relationship from an economic perspective. It's trade, of course, uh, issues of intellectual property. We're having kind of a, a race on 5G tech and other tech issues. Who's gonna, who's gonna put in place the infrastructure for the modern, um, uh, internet and communications age. How do you see the U.S.-China economic relationship evolving in the Biden-Harris administration? Uh, so I, I think it's thorny, to say the least. You know, we saw, uh, you know, Trump put in some uh, trade barriers that uh, maybe the Biden administration doesn't want to take out. Um, it may be difficult for him to take out. Um, at the same time, you know, if we're not 
um, facilitating our trade with China, I, you know, China's a big country. The rest of the world is pretty big and they're sort of moving on without of us. Some of the things we're seeing in China now that we haven't really seen before is a lot of trust in of Chinese consumers in Chinese made goods um, that they used to rely on imports. So things like baby formula or cosmetics, even the Chinese consumer was afraid of Chinese cosmetics and Chinese baby formula. Um, but that's less true today. So you have, you know, if we are, are, you know, U.S. companies want to be able to keep selling to China. And what we saw is some of the protecting of U.S. jobs actually hurt more jobs uh, than it actually helped because it made in, inputs in some companies, the price is going up. Um, it made it hard for them to access uh, Chinese markets. I, I think that we've got to figure out how to facilitate trade in a friendly way. I think there's still a lot of fear that China's somehow, you know, manipulating markets. You know, they're, they, you know, China had a strategy perhaps of trying to sell us things cheaply by manipulating its currency. I don't think it's doing that anymore. Um, but it's kind of a, even that is sort of a funny situation for the U.S. because as consumers, if China's selling us things cheap, we're getting to buy things cheap. That's great. When was the last time you went in a store and complained because they had things on sale? Well, you don't complain as the consumer, but you do complain if you're the store next door. And so the U.S. is both the consumer and the store next door. And as the store next door, we're complaining, but a lot of our consumers are, are, are benefiting. And so that's part of how to think about this as being like a really sticky situation. You know, when it, when it comes to things like, you know, big technology investments, I, I think that um, we do have to be really careful that, you know, we don't get left behind, but also realizing that some of our restrictions end up backfiring on us. And, um, you know, if you look at like the ways in which we had restrictions on encryption technology, uh, you know, decades ago, it ended up actually facilitating the development of encryption technology outside of the U.S. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot to wrestle with there. Barry, it, it strikes me that one area there might be the possibility for significant cooperation with China is on climate change and the environment. And I'm wondering whether you see any possibilities in that space that are worth exploring that you hope the Biden-Harris administration will take up, or, or maybe even are there any early signs that that might, that might take hold? Clearly, despite the challenges in Alaska that have been discussed and these other questions, this is one that has been seen as potentially unifying the U.S. and China. Perhaps these two great carbon emitters would see some common cause and common benefit. And I would not rule that out. Uh, the president is going to try to put together a Zoom-based global summit for Earth Day coming up relatively soon. But the climate international piece that's most important is what happens in Glasgow, the next conference of parties meeting uh, later this year in November. That's when the countries will really begin talking even more about their commitments and pledges, what can and cannot be reconciled. Uh, you know, we're seeing in both countries, tremendous development of technology, tremendous skills. The Chinese approach this somewhat differently. The Chinese have been very active in moving toward electric vehicles in ways that are now beginning to catch the eyes of not only Elon Musk, but a lot of the major vehicle manufacturers in the U.S. who want access to that market. So the trade possibilities and technological shifts and changes are, are, are certainly possible. China's also moving forward with a series of pilot programs to do uh, cap and trade, a version of carbon pricing in their largest urban areas. May actually be ahead, ironically, of the U.S. in terms of developing this kind of market based policy. How exactly these puzzle pieces fit together or even pledges that might be made later this year is a little bit hard to see. And yet I think you're right. And this is an area where I, we've still begun to see some early signs that both, both sides 
US and China, see some interest in possibly working together. And it's also the one where many of our other uh, trade allies, uh, Canada, the European Union, uh, some of our other Asian allies, very much want for this to happen and are on their own really stepping up. I mean, the real leadership in the world on climate is not in the United States and not in China. Uh, it's in the European Union, other Asian countries, uh, and to some extent, North, some of them are North American activity that we're seeing in Canada. Can, can, can basically the U.S. and China, who have the biggest contribution to this in terms of emissions, can they begin to catch up with these other parts of the world and find ways to, to create a, a win out of this situation? So very possible, but not a smooth, clear path in terms of what that's going to look like yet. If Mary, I, I think you've seen some subnational cooperation, right, between subnational entities in China and in in uh, in Canada and in other parts of the world. Uh, are those strategies that you think might build towards a national collaboration? I think that this question of how these different affiliations work is really intriguing. I think it's fascinating to note that the state of California, under both Republican and gov Democratic governors for over 20 years, has actively sought partnerships, alliances, held climate change summits. This is actually preceding Arnold Schwarzenegger's arrival in Sacramento. I would also note that California's only trading partner in its own carbon pricing scheme is the Canadian province of Quebec. There's active exploration and discussion of this. And of course, one of the things that makes President Biden's job a lot easier going into these discussions is the mixture of state and, 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 and local policies that are already in place that to the extent we actually have already begun to reduce a fair amount of our emissions, particularly in the electricity sector, a part of that is the transition from coal to natural gas, but it's also a kind of summing of what all of these sub-federal policies and activities might be. There's already been some exploration amongst some of these state and even regional groups of really turning to the Biden administration and advocating for that kind of link and partnership. Because to this point, if an American state is talking to another government, even on a technology transfer or mutual recognition on methane emissions, that's hard to arrange. And there's some thinking that the, the emerging Biden team, and especially Gina McCarthy, the kind of domestic climate policy czar who's worked for two governors, worked closely with states when she was head of EPA in the Obama administration, is kind of the, the grand expert on how you put these things together, including the really unique Northeastern partnership, the, national, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is probably a model approach for how you would do any kind of multi-jurisdictional cooperation in the world, and has clearly influenced how China has gone about this, 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 this very policy tool, so yes. If I could add one thing too, I think um, just as as Betsy and Barry are talking also about technology, um, one of the things that I think is happening and and could possibly be sped up to help with both climate change and um, other aspects is on the technology transfer, which would be moving things off of the Arms Export Control Act and uh, the military list of equipment and technology to the commerce controlled um, dual use application or strictly civilian use application. And that would make um, it much easier also for us to export goods and for receiving countries. But that's another way that we can operate together with other countries and also um, promote and protect our own uh, technology. So that that's, you know, again, I think that sort of technology transfer and exports, it's not really trade, but exports can be another way to, um, to develop both on the environmental side, but also on the economic side. Actually, and let me just add to that, like you, just to circle back, Michael, to your question on debt. I mean, this is exactly why we need to see an increase in government spending on research and development um, so that, you know, we we have some of this being funded outside, you know, from the U.S. government, making it easier to do that kind of technology transfer. You know, we've seen spending overall in the United States on research and development going down uh, over time. Companies are spending uh, even, it, you know, it's both companies are spending less on R&D but also they're shifting their R&D spending from R to D, meaning 
uh, they're not spending as much on primary research. They're spending more on developing, getting it out to market. And so we we really, if we want to continue to see long run economic growth, then we need to keep developing, uh, and we need new research. We need new insights, um, and that's got to come from some, you know, an increase in government spending on that. Thanks, thanks, Betsy. We're going to um, start to take audience questions in a few minutes. I've got a couple more um, questions to ask of our panelists, and then uh, we're going to um, take uh, audience questions. Start to take audience questions in a little bit. I'll mix them into the to the conversation. I wonder if we could um, talk about Africa. Uh, so, uh, the Trump administration was not super keen on uh, investing in the U.S. relationship with Africa. Uh, Susan, do you see signs that the new administration will take a different approach, or do you have uh, hopes uh, about the direction that we'll see in the African continent in terms of U.S. relations? And then, Barry and Betsy, I'm interested in the role you see for Africa on on issues of environmental um, uh, uh, control or climate change, and and the broader um, uh, prospects for Africa and the global economic scene. So maybe I'll, I'll ask Susan to, to start us off. Yeah, well, you know, they have held um, a number of conversations and hearings with um, Africa experts or Africanists, and um, there does seem to be a much greater commitment, um, which can be sort of double-edged sword. Um, you know, we like to think that everyone believes the way that we, whoever we individually are, um, but some African countries were quite fine with um, the last administration kind of having a hands-off approach. Um, they don't necessarily want so much involvement and engagement in their affairs. Uh, and, you know, historically we have um, we have called out, you know, bad behavior against African nations, Latin American nations, um, at the, you know, without doing the same to our big countries that we have, um, financial arrangements with, or we, you know, want their oil or some other aspect. Um, but so I think that, yeah, I do believe that there is a, a greater commitment um, to being engaged. Um, I know that the president's first call to uh, a, an African head of state was to President Kenyatta. Uh, they have been working on a trade deal, um, a bilateral uh, trade agreement with Kenya. Um, there have been calls from Congressman Meeks to uh, support the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which has been uh, signed and ratified by 54 of the 55 states in Africa, uh, all but Eritrea. Um, and, you know, in terms of the other aspects of the relationship, there are a number of elections that are being held, uh, some that have just recently been held, another set that are coming up. And um, as we saw, President Biden just dispatched um, Senator Coons out to Ethiopia with that brewing conflict. It's not just the conflict within um, Ethiopia and Tigray, but also they're having border skirmishes with Sudan. They're discussing and debating uh, the GERD, the uh, Grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, and that has an impact further afield. It looks like the administration is going to appoint um, former career diplomat um, Feltman to be the new Horn of Africa envoy. Um, and that's great because he has experience on the Middle East uh, as well as more broadly, including at the United Nations. And so that's what we need because there are so many different players involved in Africa right now um, you know, obviously China is, is, has overtaken us in terms of, uh, investments and, and, um, trade, but their, their Turkey is big, the UAE, Israel. I mean, everybody is on 
the African continent. So we would be wise, I, I believe, to continue our engagement. Um, there are ways to support the Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, with technical support and advising, if wanted, desired. Um, and also uh, another aspect is AGOA, the um, African Growth and Opportunities Act, which will be expiring in 2025. So um, yeah, I think there's uh, a real commitment to working with African nations and leaders, but also a recognition that a lot of states uh, on the continent are fragile and that our country is fragile too as a democracy, as we have all seen quite recently, um, something that most other states had recognized about the United States, even if we did not. Thanks, Susan. Um, Barry, do you see what do you see um, happening in terms of the environmental debate on the African continent or its role in uh, climate change mitigation? You know, climate change poses pretty scary concerns for every continent, but certainly when you think of the African consequences on top of all the other challenges. And I really do think going back, Susan, to your earlier point on technology transfer, thinking about that broadly and creatively is an enormous opportunity. This would be very different than a Chinese Belt and Road Strategy 2.0 coming in for massive infrastructure. It would be moving across all of the areas, agriculture and how you plant crops, how petrostates like Nigeria might transition away from decades of abuse in their energy sector toward alternatives that might be very viable and appropriate under a very decentralized energy production system that we could see in Africa, contrary to the what we've had thus far in industrialized countries across the board. We've not had that thus far. And I think certainly we see in the African context, but other places around the world, the issue may not be exactly how many tons of carbon we reduce in a given year, but do we begin to be generous partners, not just with money and advice and cajoling in terms of what you should do, but some of the very kinds of technology issues. To go back to our very first point, I think this is where the way that the Biden administration has structured this is an all of government approach, forcing units that are either purely domestic or more international to begin to talk with one another, having experienced leadership to weigh those considerations could be very, very significant, especially if there is going to be this massive investment on, you know, as Betsy puts it well, both, you know, the research and then the development side of all of these technologies that could position America for a very, very unique leadership role to play. And, and I think, you know, just adding on to that, um, one of the things that has, um, has plagued Africa, and I mean, it's long also because of the legacy of uh, colonialism and, and whatnot, with restructuring their economies to benefit the West, whichever that country might have been. Um, so we disrupted the way that they did business. So coming up with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and um, other opportunities has been really important so that they can trade within their own, um, within the continent, uh, as well as um, just a recognition that what they need and want, they don't want to continue exporting raw materials. That benefits us. So going back to Betsy's point of being both you know, the consumer and the store next door. Um, so sure, but they need to be in a position, have that technology, have the actual industry to make the finished product and not only exporting the raw material, which obviously doesn't make as much money. And so if investments were really done in that way, um, that's what would benefit the African nations. So I, I just wanted to jump in with two points. And um, one is that people sometimes think like, oh, economic growth is going to mean like it's even worse for the environment because, you know, people get richer and they consume more stuff. But actually, economic growth typically comes with more efficiency. Um, and some of that efficiency actually can be used to improve the environment. So I think it's really important that we continue to push for economic growth 
um, in Africa and, and around the globe, frankly, where we think about how do we, you know, do more with less. We may even choose it, but it's not, you know, we may choose to think about distribution as well. And so that's my second point, which is as much as we spend time thinking about um, within country inequality, most of the inequality is uh, between countries um, and across country, you know, across countries. And so trying to think about these issues of environmental justice, economic justice has to start thinking about, you know, how we interact with other countries, you know, to, to put Ambassador Page's uh, point on it, right? Like, it, it, you know, what's good for them, they need to be able to pursue what is good for them. Um, and we need to make sure that we aren't artificially getting them to do something that's bad for them uh, in the long run in order to suit our needs by using, you know, our current economic power in a way that's kind of bullying um, and getting them to make, um, you know, myopic decisions, things that are good in the short run, but then going to be long in the long, uh, bad in the long run. Um, thanks, all three of you. I'm going to start uh, turning to uh, audience questions. And the first one is about the minimum wage. The question, I'll maybe turn to Betsy for this. Do you think that the minimum wage measure will put additional inflationary pressure to the American economy? How can it be sustainable in small states that have adopted the 725 wage, such as Utah? Would that lead to a massive unemployment wave? Um. Okay, so there are actually sort of three questions there. So let me break it down. Um, the first is, would it lead to a massive unemployment wave? And the answer to that is a clear no. Economists have studied uh, rises in the minimum wage. And what we see is that there are not massive changes in employment. So it's massive what is the clear no. Um, the debate is around, are there small losses in employment? or zero losses in employment. So sort of the worst case scenario is uh, there is some loss of employment, but it, again, it's it's not massive. Um, what we tend to see uh, is teenagers have that harder time getting that you know weekend or after school uh, minimum wage job. Um, and we tend to see that the more skilled workers among minimum wage workers who tend to be older parents, et cetera, are able continue to be able to get jobs and now they get it at a, at a living wage. So either, you know, if what you're worried about is trade-off, right? The trade-off is some people earn a living wage and other people can't get access to work. Um, that may even be a trade-off you're willing to take. So I, I'm not even gonna tell you don't think about it in trade-off terms, but that's, but what we know for sure from the data is it's not massive um, and it, it's unlikely to even be big. That doesn't necessarily mean it's zero. So how is it sustainable in small states uh, that, um, that, that do have people working at 725 is how I interpret the question. So lots of states have raised their, their state or local minimum wage above that. So it wouldn't impact them the same way. Um, other states, even though their minimum wage, they may not have a minimum wage. Uh, they might just might not find that there are very many people willing to work for 725. So 725 has sort of become irrelevant. So you might think of those states as not even really having a minimum wage um, or because there's not one that's binding. Um, I, you know, and, and that sort of gets to the, would it put additional inflationary pressure? So if we're pushing up wages at the bottom, um, what, what happens? It does, the research does show that tends to go through to consumers. So that's the inflationary pressure that you're talking about. Now realize that it's not dollar for dollar. And so it's not like we're going to get this massive increase in inflation. And I want to put this in another context, which is what we have seen um, really over the last two decades has been a decrease in what economists call the labor share of income. So let's take all the income in the country and think of it as a pie. And we're going to divide it into the part that workers get and the part that people who own machines, capital, et cetera, get. And what's been happening is the labor is getting a, a smaller and smaller and smaller share of that pie. Um, and, and that balance isn't working out really well. That's why I, I think we got a lot of political arguments over this. Um, it just, and we need to adjust to it. There's a lot of reasons why it's happening partially because we're becoming efficient at doing things with, with fewer workers. Um, and so people, you know, you get a company like Amazon 
that's making a lot of money, but it's not giving a lot of that money to its workers. What happens if we force Amazon to give more of those money, the money to the workers? Some of that's going to just mean there's less profits for the shareholders. There's less profits for the owners of the capital. So some of what can happen is just that <clears throat> readjusting of the share and that will, won't show up necessarily in prices. So some of it's going to go to, through to the consumer in prices and some of it is going to mean that, you know, that investment in Amazon you made isn't going to be worth quite as much. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, really comprehensive and, and helpful, clear answer to that. Um, the second question from the audience is um, immigration touches economics, foreign affairs, the environment. How do you think the administration will manage what is now becoming a potential crisis on the border? And I guess by implication, not just the, the crisis with the border with Mexico, but issues of migration around the world are, um, ha have been uh, front and central in uh, many countries around the world. Uh, and uh, dealing with immigration has led to some I think quite um, anti-democratic movements around the world, uh, decline of um, uh, openness to social welfare policies. And as the question uh, suggests, migration has a huge impact on environmental sustainability. So I'm wondering um, which of you um, wanna uh, start this question. It might be a, a multi-part um, uh, uh, engagement, and I'll just see uh, who, who wants to dig in first on the question of the role of migration in the current world. I'll, I'll start. Um, so I, I would say that uh, on the one hand, um, people are fleeing countries in some cases because of the effects of climate change. Um, they can no longer, you know, if they're uh, agriculturalists, they don't have water, they don't have they can't feed their animals, um, and this is a, their livelihood. Um, uh, lack of space, lack of you know land. Uh, some of, sometimes it's climate related. Sometimes it is the policies of the government um, of their their governments, and of course you know crime and um, violence and all the other reasons that people everywhere want to live in security. Uh, so, you know, the um, various immigrate, uh, various international organizations have come together and have formed these sort of packs about migration. So the International Organization of Migration uh, working internationally has tried to come up with a, a sort of platform for what would be considered, you know, stable migration. Um, part of the problem with that, though, is there's this assumption that, um, you know, Europeans have been turning people away, as have other countries. But the, I, I think one of the failures, at least in the case of Africa, is that people often think that Africans are fleeing Africa and coming to Europe or North America, when in fact, in the case of Africa, there are of course exceptions, um, most Africans stay on the continent. So they might be migrating, but they're not migrating across a continent. They are going from a conflictual situation in the DRC and moving to Uganda or um, uh, Kenya, Sudan, South Sudan, et cetera. And so um, the, we also have to look at the impact of the hosting countries. So you think about Jordan and how many refugees they're hosting from Syria, um, Turkey signing agreements that, you know, to take a certain number of refugees. Um, they're, they're being paid to do that. And the impact then on the communities that are hosting all of, all of these people that also has an environmental impact and of course an economic impact. So I, I, I will leave the border, um, the nearby borders to someone else, but um, I see that President Biden has uh, made uh, Vice President Harris his point person on the crisis at the border. Not um, an easy job. 
Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, it, it, it is a crisis and um, I, I, I don't have the answer to that, except that obviously people are fleeing real, true problems. Um, and, uh, um, you know, in some cases being forced to wait in Mexico before they can have their asylum hearings held. Um, so I think there's some change on the way that that could at least facilitate some of that. And I know that there is a challenge before the court. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Barry, you've been leading a, a North American wide effort, uh, US, Mexico and Canada effort to understand migration and climate change and trade for the last several years. I'm wondering what your perspective is on the on the current uh, situation. You know, clearly climate is not the only factor driving people to move in North America, but there's every reason to think in Mexico and Central America, where we know climate effects are beginning to occur, it's only going to contribute to those issues and challenges as people begin to move. And of course, one of the challenges with climate change is knowing broadly what the future is going to look like, but not knowing with exactitude what those local impacts are going to be, how bad the wildfires are going to be, how serious the droughts are going to be. That's really hard to know and prepare for. One of the issues that has emerged in some of our conversations, American frontier, is can you know, the United States use this moment to think what its policies on immigration are? At one level, there are some parallels here with climate change that we have gone a quarter century or more without really clear definition by a legislature and a Congress. What are the rules of the game for immigration? How do we set this up? And so to what extent will we rely, as certainly we have in the climate and environment space for over a quarter century, purely on what an administration wants to do while it's in office and then navigate pushback that it inevitably gets from states and local governments? Is it possible to put this into more of a legislative framework and develop policies that are not only durable, but functional and send clearer signals. And of the, among the many things that we could do, I still tend to think on the immigration front, that is truly job one. And it strikes me a huge area for bipartisan potential. And yet, in all likelihood, we continue to kick this down the road from one administration to the next. And that doesn't serve anyone. You know, I I, I think to, to shift this to thinking a little bit about the economics, um, we're, we're in just sort of a, a difficult situation, which is we have, uh, you, you, you have the Republicans who've sort of shifted to this almost sort of closed borders perspective. They're um, not very supportive of immigration, and they also are now not as supportive as trade, right? They used to be uh, pro-trade and anti-immigration, and then we had Democrats who were pro-immigration and anti-trade, and yet these two policies are like this kind of schizophrenic, right? It's like, um, I don't want the jobs to, you know, I don't want the jobs to move to you, but I'm okay with you moving to the jobs. I, I don't want you moving to the jobs, but I'm okay with the jobs moving to you. Um, I, you know, personally, I already said, I, I think that, you know, inequality around the globe uh, is actually the biggest problem. And so the more we allow the free movement of people and goods, the more we eradicate inequality uh, by letting people move to uh, a better uh, a place where they think they're going to be able to better thrive. I think the challenge is this is coming at a time where we're seeing a real push uh, for more safety nets, um, for increased taxation and increased support. And that just rubs people, a lot of people the wrong way where they see these others coming in who are going to get some of their hard-earned money. And so I think that's going to continue to be um, a really thorny issue for the Biden administration. How do they prioritize their desire to build a much bigger safety net, have more paid leave, uh, have greater child tax credits that are fully refundable, all these things that they want to do to try to support families at the bottom, while at the same time trying to bring in a lot more families where a lot of people might see them as joining the families uh, at the bottom of the income distribution and therefore getting what people think of as handouts. I think it's a thorny place to be. 
Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, the Biden administration's like, you know, right out the door with a immigration challenge on the border, um, that, you know, they're going to have to figure out how they prioritize like comprehensive immigration reform type policies with sort of pushing on other aspects of their ac economic agenda. Um, and I agree with what, you know, I, I was already said, which is that the environmental issues is just going to continue to put this pressure. And so we're going to have to decide what and how we approach immigration. I should also say that, you know, we just had a global pandemic that certainly raised a lot of questions about crossing borders and who's going to shut their border, what borders can shut, who you shut them to. Um, and I, I don't think this is our last global health crisis. And so I think that's also going to keep putting pressure on the immigration uh, question. Thanks, Betsy. Um, let me um, stick with you just for one, one more uh, uh, question, and then I'm going to loop back to our others, our other guests. Uh, you've been working on the area of, of, of family justice, of economic rights for women for many, many years. There's a lot embedded in the stimulus bills under the end of the Trump administration and the, and the beginning of the Biden administration that affects family policy in a pretty fundamental way. How do you think we're doing so far on that front? And are we learning things in the last two years that could help change our policies towards families in the in the next decade? Well, I, I think we are learning things and I sure hope we change. Um, you know, I, I think we're at a point in time where we're realizing that, you know, let's think about in 1938, we passed the Fair Labor Standards Act. And that was really in response to the Great Depression, where we realized we needed some rules around our labor market so that it could work better for workers. But in that, in those days, the idea of a worker was a dad, a man, and who was bringing home uh, income to a family. Um, now we need to think about two people working or just children who are in homes where all parents work and where all workers have some kind of caregiving responsibilities, you know, for kids, for parents, for friends. Um, and then how do we design workplace policies to allow people to move seamlessly between uh, their work lives and their personal lives in a way where they can be as productive as possible at work while still taking care of their care responsibilities? For the last couple of decades, as you said, I've been working on this issue, gathering up statistics. We learn, th you know, we see things like, 50% uh, of parents say that they think they could be more productive in their job if they had more uh, flexibility in their schedule. They could choose when to come and go. And, you know, we just had a massive experiment in workplace flexibility. And what did we find? We found those workers were more productive at home. Thank God for that, because you had a lot of managers distracted from their primary product and focused on COVID and keeping their customers and their workers safe. So we would have had even bigger productivity declines in national statistics if we hadn't had this big boost that came out of work from home. So that turned out to be true. We have uh, care prime age caregivers who say that they're care taking care of like an elderly parent. Half of those prime age. So prime age is when we think of working age, you know, sort of 25 to 55. Half of the people who are taking care of uh, adult and are not working say that their caregiving responsibilities are why they aren't working. So if we could help solve that problem, a lot of those people may come into the labor force. So I, I think we're seeing that care has to be part of a modern economy. And so I'm hoping for big change. If you look though at the stimulus bill, what we got was what I think of as a pilot program, <laughs> a pilot program and giving money to families, giving money to children, and uh, in, uh, in paid leave, because these things are all temporary. They're not gonna last. And I think we need to look at what they do. And one of the things that I am hoping I can sh help shift the national dialogue a little bit on is right now we're talking a lot about what a lack of caregiving means for women. And I actually wanna talk about what it means for children. <laughs> Um, and what it means to not invest in our kids, where our kids are, where is the economy in 20 years if we failed to invest in the kids? And what do, you know, thinking about children's rights, you know, do, do our politicians represent the children and, and what do they have a right to? And so when I think about something like the child tax credit, 
I think we are moving in the direction and thinking about supporting kids because kids have independent rights, not just supporting their parents who are taking care of kids, but actually what do kids need? The child tax credit expansions mean we've, we're putting money in 92% of kids' households. We lifted an enormous amount of kids out of poverty. This is a, a massive experiment, but what's going to take some effort, a lot of effort from the Biden administration to then, you know, propel that forward into the future. Um, but I think we're going to see that a generation of kids who are financially supported are going to end up doing better as adults. Could, could I just add to that really quickly? Um, I just wanted to say, I think that's exactly right, um, what Betsy has, has stated. And although this is not my field of expertise by any means, I think one of the issues goes right back to um, Barry's comments about legislation. This is the reason why we need legislative responses to these temporary measures. And one of the places to do that is in the tax code, um, which embeds exactly what what Betsy started with, which is, you know, it looks at man married breadwinner. Um, and that's not the makeup of families, most families these days. For sure. Let me, um, Susan, let me um, uh, keep it with you just for a moment. Um, we have a alumni in the audience, and so I want to bring things back to the University of Michigan itself. Uh, you've recently made this big transition in your life from serving at the highest levels of the U.S. State Department as ambassador to South Sudan and in the U.N. and other senior postings. And now you've come into the Ford School as a professor of practice. I'm wondering if you could tell our um, audience, our alumni, what it's been like for you and how you're finding the experience um, being back on the University of Michigan campus? Well, it's been wonderful. Um, I have to say, even though I have not met a lot of my colleagues because of the pandemic, um, I have had the warmest welcome back. Um, I have managed to meet a few people when it was, you know, previously when the weather was was still nice and warm. And we're going back, you know, into that spring phase now with the weather uh, warming up and it being nice outside. So it, it's been really great. Um, I had almost forgotten what it's like to be at a university and be stimulated all of the time with new ideas and learning. And I'm learning even as I teach because I have to look up materials to provide for the students to read and review. And so it's, it's been a really nice, uh, nice change. And great to be back in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Susan. Um, Barry, let me ask you to also talk about a University of Michigan topic. And that's the work you've been doing. You've been a key participant in the president's initiative, uh, moving the university towards carbon neutrality uh, as part of this presidential commission. I'm wondering, you, you just released a report. I'm wondering if you could tell our community a little bit about it and, and um, how you see things going from here. Sure. In fact, we met with President Schlissel just a week ago to hand off the report and hand over the big challenge that he and other leaders at the university face in thinking about implementation challenges. This whole question of how universities engage on environmental issues, how they are energy stewards and users is an intriguing one. And certainly on our campus, when you think not only of our immediate campus, but all the Michigan clinics around the, around the state, the Dearborn and Flint campuses, that larger partnership, we could go to zero carbon emissions and we're not going to do it immediately, wouldn't solve this problem. But we felt that we've had both a responsibility, but also a real opportunity to take advantage of the expertise, technology, resources that we have here. And we did indeed deliver a plan to the president, which lays out a series of timetables to achieve carbon neutrality. It's a combination of standards or regulatory provisions, if you will. There are investment elements, and there's also a provision for an internal carbon tax, which to our knowledge would make the University of Michigan the first public research university in the country to establish a carbon price with some of those funds then used for energy transition. So it was a remarkable opportunity for me. I'm very, very grateful for the chance to work with so many people across the campus and a particular thanks to, to you know those folks who, who contributed and our, some of our Ford colleagues. And looking forward to see what, how the university decides to proceed. Thanks, Barry. 
Um, I'm going to um, uh, ask each of you uh, to just say, take maybe one minute, maybe a little less than a minute, um, 30 seconds, uh, final parting words for our wonderful audience in Washington, D.C. and around the world, because I need to leave a couple minutes at the end um, for our, uh, our co-hosts, the University of Michigan, Washington, D.C. Alumni Club. So let me just ask uh, Betsy, Susan, and then Barry, you know, final thoughts you want to leave our wonderful audience with? Uh, I think, you know, my final thoughts are to remember, as you think about the damage that happened to the U.S. economy that was actually caused by COVID and not by any response to COVID. And so as we start to vaccinate and actually eradicate COVID from our environment, that's when we'll recover. Um, and, you know, we're certainly making a lot of progress on that. Uh, I have been thrilled to see those 100 million jabs happen uh, on a much faster timeline. Uh, so hopefully we'll all be seeing each other in person and not too long. Thank you. Um, I, I'll be very brief. I, I, I'll just sort of say that I think that um, this new administration um, is, uh, is hopeful. Um, you know, is giving us some hope, both in terms of how they're responding to the pandemic, but also rising to the many challenges that that face them. So, um, I'm uh, I'm I'm hopeful that things will get better, not just with the pandemic, but also how the administration at all levels, um, a including at state level and uh, local level how the economy can get better, how people can get better, and what the future will look like now that we have had this great experiment of working from home for those who have been able to, to do so. Thank you. Barry, final thoughts? There have been moments in the last half century where the US has led the world and innovated in airs, issues of air and water, other environmental arenas, but in recent years, decades, that has not been how the world has viewed the U.S. Climate change is an enormous challenge, far greater than was originally anticipated, and the problems are alive, arriving much more, er, much earlier and more aggressively than we thought. This is truly a moment to begin to press that reset button and think anew about what the U.S. might be able to accomplish in this arena through public policy that cuts across the board, it combines all of the areas uh, that are engaged. And it's been a remarkable first journey in these first weeks of the Biden administration. Thank you, Barry. And thank you, Susan. Thank you, Betsy, for this wonderful conversation. I'm now going to turn it over for a message from uh, Nicole Taylor, who's the president of the Washington, D.C. University of Michigan Alumni Club. And uh, again, thank you to our wonderful panelists for this great conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Taylor and I'm the president of the University of Michigan Alumni Club in Washington, DC. I'd like to take a minute to thank you all for attending the event tonight. And I'd also like to thank the Ford School for collaborating with our club on this event. If you enjoyed this event, I encourage you to check out our website, umdc.org, where you can find information on our 70th Congressional Breakfast. For the first time ever, our Congressional Breakfast is going virtual and we have a great slate of speakers lined up. U of M alum, Congressman Ted Deutsch will be our keynote speaker, and President Mark Schlissel will give remarks from Ann Arbor. We are also going to have special guest, Coach Joan Howard. So I encourage you to go to our website and register for the event. If you enjoyed this one, I'm sure you'll enjoy that one. The event is on April 14th, so we hope to see you there. Thank you all and have a great night.